you probably have a booklet. Uh, there's a booklet of notes, but we can follow it here. But let me just, uh, this is as far as, we, this is the outline we've been using. Now our focus is on the Passion Week of Jesus. Why, why do we call it the Passion Week? You ever think about that? Where did that come from? Well, I don't know for sure, but my suspicion is that it comes from the old King James. Uh, how many of you read the King James or man enough to admit it? You know what I like to say? But, but uh, no, the old King James of, the, uh, of, of, of Acts chapter 1, where Luke says that uh, he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, and we'll wind up there in the morning service with the resurrection. But the point is that uh, that word, that does in fact, it's a, it translates a Greek word that means an outpouring of suffering and anguish and, and, and passion, but that has become sort of the word that, uh, uh, the, the, the rubric under which we uh, place all of the events of this final week. And as I said yesterday, it is, bless God, an eight-day week and, uh, because uh, it's Sunday to Sunday. And if it weren't for that latter Sunday, which we will celebrate here later on, it w we wouldn't be here this morning. But anyway, I, break, I like to break the week down in, in this way, that uh, Sunday, that is the first Sunday, the triumphal entry, is a day of messianic presentation. And Jesus made that happen. He orchestrated it. He planned for it. He alerted the city to his coming in the most clever and deliberate way. So that when he did ride into the city on Sunday morning, uh, he was, he was uh, welcomed with huge crowds and excitement. But what we need to understand is that day, and, and, and it was April 29, 33 AD, that day was, do you know what it was? And I said this yesterday, but it was the day to which Psalm 118 refers when it says, this is the day which the Lord has made. And it's interesting, as Jesus left the city of Jerusalem on that first Sunday, on that day of triumphal entry, of presentation, he wept over the city and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, if only you had known what belongs to you on this thy day. And so when the psalmist in Psalm 118, which is a messianic psalm, where God is teaching his people how to receive the Messiah when he appears and they are taught to cry out, this is the day which only God could have made, the day which fulfills the promise of Genesis 3.15, that God is going to raise up from the seed of woman, one who would crush the skull of the tempter and, 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 and bring victory over the curse of sin. And so that's messianic present day, that one day of official, deliberate, well-prophesied presentation. But... The city welcomed him with great excitement on that day, and we asked the question, given Sunday, why Friday? And uh, that is, given their welcome on Sunday, why are they crying for his crucifixion on Friday? I think the answer is Monday and Tuesday, because on Monday and Tuesday, Jesus returns to the city, first of all, cleanses the, the, the temple, seizes the temple, and, uh, and demonstrate, or, or I like to say it this way, behaves himself more messianically than any other time in his ministry because in his life because he took control of the temple and the scriptures say explicitly malachi 3 that when messiah comes he will come suddenly to his temple and uh and and, and ezekiel has messiah ruling from the temple and for sure enough jesus for two days cleanses and controls the temple and on tuesday uh his enemies having spent the whole night trying to come up with some means by which they might catch him in his words Jesus uh, puts them all to open silence and demonstrates his wisdom and, uh, and, and, and speaks parables of condemnation. And then he, he goes to the 110th Psalm and demonstrates his deity and his messiahship, the Messiah would be uh, Lord. And then, and then as he leaves the, the temple on Tuesday afternoon, and this is important to what we're going to talk about, uh, as he leaves the temple on Tuesday afternoon, uh, he speaks, a, it's Matthew 23, and he speaks a series of stunning, excoriating woes, woe upon you, and on just one crowd, scribes and Pharisees. Now, they're joined at the hip, but uh, uh, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, and you compass land and sea to make one proselyte, and when you make a proselyte, he's twofold more that 
child of hell than he was before, and, and you're like blind guides and whited sepulchers, and you brood of vipers. How shall you condem- uh, escape the, the condemnation of hell? But what's at stake there, what you've got to understand, is that those Pharisees were revered by the people. And so when Jesus, when Jesus confronts them on that, on that Tuesday afternoon, uh, I like to say that, number one, that is, the answer to, that is the answer to the question given Sunday, why Friday? Because on Tuesday, on Monday, Jesus offers himself legitimately as the long-awaited deliverer and savior. But on Monday and Tuesday, I like to say, he made this point. You, you, you will have me as your Messiah on my terms and not on your terms. And if you think that you can cling to the Pharisaic hope of salvation by works, by keeping the law, and still claim me as your Messiah, you're mistaken. So you're going to make a choice. It's either me or the Pharisees. And I, I won't take any time now, but just please understand that the Pharisees were... The, you know, the most important uh, fraternity in Jewish life. And as I say, they, they were professional, full-time law keepers because they taught that that's how you gain entrance into the kingdom. And, uh, and, and the persuasion was that, uh, that uh, if you support your local Pharisee and so on, that you can kind of ride into the kingdom on the, his coattails. So for Jesus to speak that kind of excoriation, you know, the word woe, is W-O-E, is, is generally in the scriptures, I mean, not exclusively, but generally used uh, of a curse upon some pagan Gentile nation which had cursed and troubled Israel. Woe unto you, all these various nations, and Isaiah and Jeremiah and so on. So for Jesus to use that terminology of the most important leaders, the most respected leaders in the Jewish world, was dramatic stuff. But uh, so that was, that was days of messianic proclamation. Now, Tuesday night, Jesus, I'm sorry, Tuesday night, Jesus and the disciples went back to Bethany, but Judas sneaked off and made a bargain. And his bargain was to help the enemies of Jesus, the Jewish enemies, the Sanhedrins, uh, Sanhedrinists, take Jesus in the absence of the multitude. That was their problem. They wanted to be rid of him. They are desperate now. There's a price on his head. Ever since Lazarus was raised from the dead, they have publicly committed to putting him to death, the, the Jewish leadership, the Sanhedrin. But uh, Jesus is so clever that they can never find him in the absence of the multitude. And if they try and arrest him with the crowds around, uh, there will be a riot and they can't handle that. So Judas sneaks away and makes a bargain to help them arrest him in the absence of the multitude, Luke 22 and verse 6. And now he, uh, uh, Wednesday, and, and so there's a plot laid, laid on Tuesday night to get Jesus arrested, tried, sentenced, and on his way to execution while the city sleeps. That's hugely important because, as I keep saying, Jesus' enemies, both Roman and Jewish, have Sunday, Monday, Tuesday ringing in their ears. That is, they, they, they remember when the city welcomed him as king and when they cheered and, uh, you know, when he cleansed the temple and they were so delighted and then when he uh, put, the enemy, uh, put to silence all of his enemies and so on. So for all the, 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 the leadership can see, this city loves him. So we got to get this done under cover of night. That plot was laid on Tuesday and we're going to pick that up right now. But then uh, Wednesday is in the record a silent day, but it's a busy day because all of the preparation has to be made with the soldiers and the Sanhedrinists and Pilate's uh, uh, courtroom and so on. All those preparations have to be made because Thursday is a day of messianic preparation. And it's twice that because, first of all, it's the day when the Passover is to be slain and eaten after the sun goes down. And so... They do, in fact, gather for the Passover in a room high on the western hill, villa. And uh, up in the upper room, Jesus prepares his disciples. Actually begins to preach after Judas leaves, and then he gets up and leaves, and they make their way down to Gethsemane. All along the way, Jesus is preaching. And then they get to that little uh, uh, olive oil production plant, that Garden of Gethsemane. And there, Jesus prepares his own heart in a rather gut-wrenching season of prayer as he begs the Father if there be any way. And I said yesterday that I think that's 
God's way to give us some glimpse into the terror of the cross as Jesus anticipates it. And, uh, but then he always says, not my will but thine be done. And after that season of prayer, he wakes his disciples, makes his way out. Meanwhile, Judas has followed his steps. Judas had gone off to fetch the soldiers. He comes back to the upper room. It's empty. So he comes down to Gethsemane. John tells us that Judas knew the place, knew it well. They often stayed there. And so he comes down and Jesus is arrested. And it's a dramatic scene, but just as Jesus had foretold, his disciples desert him. And now we have Friday, a day of messianic perfection, and it begins with a series of hearings. And that's what I want to talk about this morning in, in Sunday school. That is the... Uh, uh, the, the series of, and, and, of, of, all right, you often talk about the Jewish trials and then the Roman trials. I'll just put it on the record that the Jewish trials were not really trials. They were hearings that were designed. The, the problem that the Jewish authorities had, all right, you know what, I'm going to do something. I forgot my booklet. And, and I, I, it might help to turn to that, because I got a lot of detail. But So if you go to page uh, 15, if you have that booklet, and uh, I think it might help to coordinate the two. So you've got, uh, yeah, Jesus is arrested at the top of the page. And then I have Friday morning before and after dawn, and I'll explain that. Uh, Jesus is tried by the Jewish leadership. Now, I've laid that out on the page, but I'm going to go through it very quickly because I really want to talk about the Roman trials. But uh, let me just say that Jesus is arrested, and when he is arrested, he is taken up to the western hill. Uh, yeah, here I can. Uh, Jesus is arrested out here by Gethsemane, and then he's going to be brought up to the house of Caiaphas. And now Caiaphas is the high priest, and he is the primary villain in this narrative and all of its parts. And uh, he's a very crooked, wicked man, but very powerful, very wealthy, entirely in bed with the Romans. Uh, actually had bribed the Romans to have the right to be the high priest and uh, made horrible merchandise of the people. And it was Caiaphas who had said back there in John chapter 11 after Jesus was raised from the dead and uh, they brought the report to the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin being the body of local Jewish government, 70 men. But when they, the, the report was brought to, to Caiaphas, he said, this man does many signs, therefore we need to kill him because if we don't, the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. So the, it was Caiaphas who determined to put Jesus to death and has engineered this huge plot and effort to get that done on Thursday night, uh, get him prepared for the cross on Thursday night. So Jesus is arrested, and he is brought up to the priestly villa in the walled city of Jerusalem, the first century walled city, the, the priestly villa of Caiaphas. Now, again, the Jewish leadership, it's not really a trial, because a trial is an effort to determine guilt or innocence. They're not concerned about that. They want Jesus dead. And their problem is this, and it gets a little complicated, so stay with me. Their problem is that on the one hand, uh, they want him dead, but, but, but because Jesus is so popular, they, you know, let, let me say it this way. There is a good deal of discussion as to whether or not the Jews in the first century were allowed to put people to death. Could they exercise, in other words, uh, Rome was in charge of everything. They could have local trials on the Sanhedrin. The Jewish Sanhedrin was deputized by Rome to have trials and so on. But were they allowed to actually execute? And I think the answer is, is no. And the only problem with that is Stephen. That is, if they, if they weren't allowed to execute, Stephen might have been happy if they were a little more sensitive to that protocol. You know what I'm saying? Well, what's going on there? Well, the fact is that above all things, what Rome demanded is that their local officers, in this case Pilate, keep the peace, don't have a riot. And so if they want to grab somebody like Stephen, who is a nobody, well, haul him out, uh, you know, outside the city and, and put him to death, fine, we'll look the other way. But Jesus was so wildly popular, again, you got Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, 
that they can't imagine the Roman leader, I'm sorry, the Jewish leadership can't imagine that if they try and just do away with him, they're convinced and reasonably that there will be a riot. And if there's a riot and the Romans have to fetch troops from Alexandria or from uh, 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 Damascus, uh, they're going to be an investigation and they're going to be discovered as the ones who you know, initiated that riot and their heads are going to roll. So they've got to get the Romans to do it. Now remember that. The, Jew, the Jewish leadership has got to get the Romans. And it seems as if they have a, a mechanism to do that ready to hand, and that is that the, Jew, the Romans would not tolerate sedition, pretender kings. And uh, Jesus has been going about claiming to be Messiah king. So all we got to do is demonstrate that he claims to be a Messiah king. And, and by the way, Messiah means a lot to a lot of people, and appropriately, but above all other things, it means king. It means anointed, just like Saul was anointed and David was anointed. That's the point. So now you can use it more broadly, but to the Jewish mind, appropriately enough, Messiah means king, and Rome won't put up with that. So all we got to do is demonstrate to Pilate that the man claims to be a, a king. And let me just say real quickly that the, the Romans, they, they, they hated Passover because all these hundreds of thousands of Jews would come to Jerusalem, and they were all thinking about one thing, and that is that time, what's Passover about? That time when God, in fulfillment of a promise, delivered his, his covenant people against all likelihood from a horribly wicked, powerful Gentile power. That's, that's, that's Egypt. Well, guess what? There's a new horribly wicked Gentile power. It's Rome, and they have a promise. So at, 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 at Passover, every Jewish heart is sort of beating quietly with thoughts of sedition, of overthrowing at long last the, the, the Roman uh, uh, empire. And so uh, they're very skittish, the, the Romans are, and so it seems like it's not going to be hard to persuade Pilate that this man is a threat. So that's what the Jewish trials are all about. Now I am not going to go through them. Uh, I'm going to go through them very quickly. But uh, I'm going to say one more time, they're really not s s gathered to determine whether Jesus is guilty or innocent. They're gathered to come up with an credible indictment. They need to be able to go to Pilate and make the case that this man is a, is a threat to Rome, a pretender king. Now, Jesus was wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. And all throughout his ministry, though he did claim to be Messiah, he did it in the most clever way where he would take Old Testament words and pictures to himself, but he was careful not to use the word Messiah of himself. And that's why when they finally gather for the trial in the, in the great room of Caiaphas' home, his priestly villa there on the, on the Temple Mount, they can't find any witnesses who can testify, I heard the man claim to be a king, a messiah. And they're frustrated. Now let me walk you through the three stages. They're there. And, and let me say one other thing. And this, this is true of both the Roman and the Jewish trials. But you know, the, the, the critical world, the anti-biblical, anti-supernatural uh, uh, world uh, loves to pick at the Gospels and find supposed mistakes and contradictions, and, 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 and they will insist that these trials are impossible to reconstruct because you've got so much going on in, di well, in different Gospels. They fit like a glove. Your Bible is without error. Amen and amen. And, and so they fit like a glove. What you've got to understand is they, they don't all record. So, so there are three stages to the trial. Only John records the initial stage. I'd love to talk you through it. It's when Jesus, as they are making preparation for the main trial, Jesus is brought before aged Annas, who had been high priest many, many years ago, and who is Caiaphas' father-in-law, and there's a brief interrogation. Nothing comes of it. Only John tells that. That's the first stage of the Jewish trial. I'll give it to you there, but only John tells us about that. And then they finally gather in the great room and the Sanhedrin, uh, maybe not everybody, but close to 70 very aged men and so on are there. And uh, this is when you have the trial that's recorded in Matthew and Mark. And they go through it in some detail. And this is when they're not able to find witnesses and the witnesses disagree with one another. Now, I am not going to enlarge on this. But suffice it to say that, and, and this is a very sensitive point that I'm about to make, but in the course of these 
Jewish hearings early, late on Thursday, early. It's the middle of the night. And, and there, are a, there is a long list of identifiable canons of jurisprudence that were widely accepted and, 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 and really uh, for which the, the Jewish people were very, very proud because their jurisprudential system, because it was born right out of the Old Testament of King Yahweh told them how to do it, it was remarkably equitable. And there is so much to learn from the, the courtroom protocols which are laid down in the scriptures and which the Jews were very zealous about. There are at least a dozen of them that were high-handedly violated. This is a sensitive thing with the Jewish people even today. And they insist that these records must be corrupted. And their argument is simply this, and there's some merit to this argument. Their argument is we simply wouldn't do that. The Jews wouldn't do that. And it's a function of the of the depth and, and crippling character of the hatred that the Jewish leadership had for Jesus that they violated so many of their protocols, all right? And uh, one of them was, well, here's the big one. You could never have a trial in the Jewish world by their own protocols, by their own canons. You could never have a trial between sundown and sunup. And the reason was simple. You, it, it, the only way to have any sort of a trial or conviction is in the mouth of two or three witnesses. And this is a culture where where the sun goes down, you go down and you can't get witnesses in the middle of the night. And so it was absolutely, and it was rec well recognized that they could not have a trial between sundown and sunup. And it's the middle of the night. You can't have a trial in a, in a private place. They're in Caiaphas's personal villa, that is his priestly villa. You can't have a trial uh, uh, in, in a capital trial if according to the Roman, uh, according to the Jewish, not Roman, according to the Jewish law, if two in a capital case, the man's going to be executed if he's found guilty. Uh, you, you, if two witnesses con contradict each, each other, immediately the accused is let loose. So all of these various protocols. But anyway, what happens is in that second stage of the Jewish hearing, if you don't mind, they gather in the great room, and this is being overseen by Caiaphas. And they bring all these witnesses, and the witnesses disagree. And Caiaphas, what you have to understand is there are arrangements made. And at about 4.30 in the morning, they have an appointment with Pilate at his praetorium. And they have to get Jesus. They have to come up with an indictment. And the clock is ticking, and, and, and Caiaphas, out of desperation, finally, he, and this is another thing, in a, in a Jewish trial, you cannot interrogate the accused. That's why we have a Fifth Amendment, because of the reality the mouth of two or three witnesses but Caiaphas breaks that protocol and he puts Jesus under oath and he says tell us plainly are you the Christ that's that's what they want to hear they want to hear him confess to be Christ means king but Jesus throughout his ministry had claimed to be Christ the son of the living God and so Caiaphas says all right I'll play by your rules are you the Christ the son of the living God and I think Caiaphas as certainly he was desperate I don't think he really anticipated this work but he's out of ideas, and how delighted and surprised he must have been when Jesus said, absolutely I am. Now, we got him. Seventy men have just heard him claim out loud to be the Messiah. Now we got him. Now we can take him to Pilate. But this happened in the middle of the night. And so, and only Luke tells us this stage of the trial. But what happened is that he is... What, what, what they're concerned about is this. This happened in the middle of the night. So they determined that they would put him in hold until the first blush of dawn. And, at the very, and I don't mean the sun starting to show over, just grayness on the horizon. At the first blush of dawn, they'll haul him back in, no witnesses, no procedure, just ask him once again, are you the Christ, the Son of the And he will ultimately say, yes, I am. Now they've, they've, they've thrown sort of a legal a facade of legality over this, this, and so now they take him to Pilate. Now, while Jesus is being held by the soldiers, and you have to understand, these soldiers are just, you know, they've been assigned, uh, or there's some reason to believe that perhaps these were Jewish Roman soldiers, that is, Jewish soldiers who had joined the Roman, Empire, uh, Roman army and been assigned to the Sanhedrin. So they probably had some connection, but the point is, these Roman soldiers were taught above all other things to be fearful of a, a Jewish sedition. And now the Sanhedrin has insisted that this man, 
the Nazarene is a sedition. So they, and while they have him in hold, they blindfold him, cuff him, tell us who... These are not the Sanhedrin, these are the soldiers. But by now, Jesus is bruised and, and, and beaten a bit. But now they're waiting for the first blush of dawn. Now think, there is a man named Peter who had been told twice in the last couple of hours that before the sun comes up, before the rooster crows, he's going to deny Jesus three times. And that's why Peter, of course, has made his way into the courtyard, and he's already twice denied Jesus, and now he's warming his hands, and somebody comes and says, wait a minute, I know you're a Galilean, and, and, and now again, the Sanhedrinists are waiting for the first blush of dawn. So Jesus is in some sort of installation, maybe an outbuilding, maybe a, a cistern or something. He's being held and abused, but now the sun is about to come up, so he's being hauled across that courtyard to go back into the final stage of the Jewish hearing. Peter is warming his hands. It's the blush of dawn. He denies Jesus the third time, and of course at that moment before the words are out of his mouth, he hears the rooster crow, and he turns and sees Jesus, and Jesus looks upon him, and Peter goes out and weeps bitterly. But now Jesus is taken in for that third stage of the trial where he does confess that he is the Christ, and therefore he is going to be taken to Pilate. Now, that's where I want us to go. Uh, oh, So these are the stages of the uh, Jewish trial that we just went through. You know, I, I think, well, yeah, let's go through the stages of the Roman trial. Now, before I do, I want to go to 1 Timothy. Uh, 1 Timothy uh, uh, 6 and verse 13. Because Timothy says something, and I want, us, I want us to focus a little more thoroughly on the trials of Jesus before Pilate. And... Uh, and, and, and what got me thinking about this fairly carefully some years ago is I, I noticed this verse in 1 Timothy 6 where Paul, in closing out this, this, uh, this, this epistle to his, to his young uh, protege, he says, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Jesus Christ who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. And what, what struck me is there was evidently the, 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 the record of Jesus before Pontius Pilate was evidently so important to the early Christian community and, and so well known that Paul could kind of offhandedly refer to this good confession. And what Paul is saying is, I want you, young Timothy, to learn to press yourself into the mold. Go to school on this. Go to school on the way Jesus handled himself before Pontius Pilate. And when I read that, I, I thought, well, I... That wouldn't work for me. I'm not very familiar. I haven't spent the time, and so I have spent some time studying Pilate and studying this, this good confession, and it's well documented in the, in, in the, uh, in the gospel records. But uh, let me just say uh, that I, I have... <laughs> I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump way ahead. I think Pontius Pilate is a genuine biblical hero. I'll go further. I think, I, 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 okay, we'd all like to think this, but I think I, can, I have biblical reason to believe that Pontius Pilate will be in heaven, all right? And, and, and the way this unfolds is so thoroughly misunderstood that I'm going to try and walk you through the actual record. But, but the point is that on the one hand, it's hugely pivotal to just understanding the narrative that is in front of us. So we've got to come to grips with this trial before Pontius Pilate and then Herod and Pontius Pilate. But beyond that, uh, Paul is, is, is making the point that there is tremendous advantage in, 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 in understanding, and in you and I understanding this, this marvel and, and the way Jesus handled himself before Pontius Pilate. Now, when the dust settles... Pontius Pilate is going to turn Jesus over to be crucified, and we will in the morning service return to that, that narrative, of course. But uh, let me just walk you through this, this series of Roman trials. And there are three, uh, there are three steps to it. And uh, again, you have them 
on page 16 of your notes, yeah. So if you'd like to go there, but, but let me just walk you through them. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to take you first of all to John. Chapter, and, and the meat of it is in John chapter uh, 18 and 19. So in John 18 and verse 28, it simply says, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. Now let me show you something. From Caiaphas, and there is some debate about this. Uh, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back up here. So I'd like to have that map. So uh, here's the thing. Caiaphas, the house of Caiaphas, and it's quite recognized. I mean, there are a couple of places that claim today, but all the archaeological evidence is very, very certain, and there's no reason to believe otherwise that uh, the house of Caiaphas was high on the western hill. That's the good part of town. And it was very, very close to Herod's palace. Now, that's going to become important in just a moment because, uh, all right, real quickly, one of the, one, you know, your, your faith is grounded in history, and you have that sp spirit-enabled historical record in the Bible, Old and New Testament, but, but uh, it's important that it be coherent. And one of the problems you have with regard to this Roman series of trials is we don't have much time to work with. Like I say, the clock starts ticking at the first blush of dawn because that's what they were waiting for for that final stage of the Jewish trial, right? So, and that's about 4.30 in the morning. I'm going to keep working with that. I think Jesus was turned over to Pilate about 4.30 because it's the first blush of dawn. And I've sat in the roof of a hotel in Israel in the springtime and watched for the first blush of dawn and hear the roosters on. And I'll, I'll and check the tables and so on. I'll say that it was about 4.30. Now, the point is that Jesus is going to be tried by Pilate, then by Herod and Antipas, then by Pilate, and then he's going to be turned over to crucif be crucified. And it says explicitly in John 19, 14, that it was about 6 o'clock in the morning, about the sixth hour by Roman reckoning, which counts from midnight. So you only have about an hour and a half for this entire drama. And so you don't have time to be hauling Jesus across the city and so on, but you don't need it because he's brought, first of all, from the house of Caiaphas to, the, to Pilate. Where is Pilate? Well, there's some debate. I'm not going to get into it. Uh, I'll probably go there in just a minute. But I think uh, Pilate is staying in Herod's. Pilate is the Roman governor. Prefect is the title given him appropriately enough. And Roman appropriate because that's what the Bible calls him. And there was a lot of dispute about that until there was a, an inscription found in Caesarea Maritima that calls him exactly what the Bible says. But anyway, Pilate was uh, the prefect. He, 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 he reigned... For, he, he, he held that office in 26 to 36 at A.D., and he lived down in Caesarea Maritima, down on the coast. But when there was a feast of this sort, he would come up to the city. And uh, where was he staying? There's some debate, but not much anymore. I think everybody acknowledges that, all, I, I know that almost, I, I can only find one scholar who is resisting this, but uh, he stayed in Herod's palace. So, Jesus is brought from the house of Caiaphas just a couple of hundred yards up uh, around to the outside of Herod's palace. All right, now, uh, John 18 records the first... Listen, let me, let me do something here, because I can... I, I, may, may be helpful. I have here a picture. Well, there's a nice map, so there. Uh, these are the two places. Forgive me this just slight excursus. Uh, there was a long time where, where we were told that Jesus would have been tried at the Fortress Antonia. It makes no sense, and really it, nobody holds it anymore. I think it's better to understand that he was, he was tried at Herod's palace. Now, there is, this is just a picture, but there is a, a, a place on the western, uh, the western wall of the modern city, the modern western wall, actually built in the 1540s, but this wall, this huge wall, is built by... Suleiman the Magnificent in the 1540s, but um, uh, this gate system has been uncovered just very recently. And I always tell people, I love to go out here and talk through what we're talking about right now. Uh, I tell people someday they're going to build a big church over that and you won't be able to see it and you have to pay to get in. But uh, for now, it's just sitting there and nobody knows about it. And, and uh, I, it's the, 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 the archaeologist, his name is Shimon Gibson, who uncovered it. I've been there with him and so on. He's published it informally, but it really is not well known. But this is a reconstruction. Now, 
I'm going to leave it alone. Uh, it is important that it's very, very close to the house of Caiaphas because it's only going to take a few minutes to get Jesus here. It's a gate system. And I want to kind of picture it. So there would have been an outside gate. So let's say this is the courtyard. And, and there is, uh, there at the, uh, uh, do you have that pointer? It's probably not on you, huh? <laughs> That's all right. Uh, there is, all right, against the brick wall. I want you to imagine, and, and this has all been uncovered on the archaeological dig. So there's a gatehouse, and there's an outer gate and an inner gate. And uh, let's say that on, the, on, the, on your right side of that brick wall, there's a large inner gate. By the way, it's on the picture, it's right here. That is, uh, yeah, you can't, I can't make it big for you, but uh, that is the, the uh, threshold of the gate. So on the, on the, that gate takes us into Herod's, it's called the Praetorium, Praetorium simply means the, 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 the domicile, the dwelling place of the most senior official. And so when Pilate is in Jerusalem, he's staying in, the, uh, in, in Herod's beautiful, beautiful palace. Herod's palace was built by Herod the Great. He's a dead guy. He died just after Jesus was born. So he's been dead for 30 years, but he built this ma massive, marvelous palace, and it's well fortified. So when Pilate comes up from Caesarea, he's going to stay here. And there is, on the west side of the, 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 the palace, there is a gate system, a gate house. And it has an outer wall and an inner wall, an outer gate and an inner gate. So imagine a gate right over here, and then an inner gate there. And imagine a series of steps going up to a bema seat. Because all of that is evident in the archaeological. And this was a, a gate system that... Herod the Great had built so that he could have public gatherings and even do public trials and so on. So now, because the Jewish authorities don't want to go inside the praetorium, inside, thus they defile themselves, Pilate has consented to bring his judicial apparatus out here. So now, pick it up. So now, Jesus is brought, just south of us here, is, is Caiaphas's villa. They have finally gotten Jesus to confess that he is the Christ openly, and then they got him to do it immediately to break at dawn. So now they're in a hurry. They, they don't want the city to wake up. So they bring Jesus, and there are three stages. Now i got to hurry. So they bring Jesus, and he goes in that outer court, and I'm sure Pilate comes out of the gate and goes up to his bema seat and takes his seat, and he's properly attired in his, in his official whatever, or probably judicial, even he's got soldiers standing by and so on. And now, here, here's what happens. John 18, they bring Jesus to Pilate, and uh, Pilate says, uh, uh, right here, what accusation do you bring against this man? And, and they said, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Now, what they're saying is, Pilate, we sent our agents to you. We all agreed. We paid you the money. I think that's all behind it. They're saying, look, we, we got this all set up. Your job is just to send him to the cross because we've got to do this before the city wakes up. And Pilate, amazingly enough, when they say, you know, they won't identify the charge, he says, well, you take him in judgment according to your law. And the Jews said to us, it is not law for, for us to put anyone to death. Now, I'm going to come back to that latter statement. And then this is what I want you to see, that in, in, in 1 Timothy 6, Jesus refers to the good confession that Jesus made, something he said. Here's a curious reality. During the entire trial, and it's going to involve Pilate, and then off to Herod Antipas, and then back to Pilate, during the entire trial, Jesus never speaks. Except on two occasions when Pilate takes Jesus inside the praetorium. And this is the first. So now, Pilate takes Jesus in, and this is one of the most staggering and, I think, blessed elements of the narrative, but uh, uh, Jesus, I'm sorry, look at the yellow. Pilate entered the praetorium, called Jesus. So now you have the first of two private conversations between, you've got to understand this, a duly appointed, fully authorized, legitimate judge. Pilate had every, not only every uh, right, he had every responsibility to measure the truth of this claim that this man was a seditionist. 
And, and, and one of the things that I, I really don't appreciate about the way this is often read is they have Jesus kind of being snarky and talking down. Listen, Jesus is so stunningly and delightfully deferential. He ought to be. This is a legitimate trial, all right? Pilate has every right to interrogate Jesus. So he takes Jesus in that gate right there. It's just Jesus. He's already, he's shackled. He's been, he's been abused, so he's bruised and a bit bloody. But now he stands before Pilate, and Pilate says, what have you done? And uh, I'm sorry, not what have you done. He said, now this is very important. He said, are you the king of the Jews? Now, what you have to understand about that question is that it's cripplingly ambiguous. Because Pilate might be asking, are you the genuine Messiah promised to the Jews? What's the answer to that question? You bet them. Or he might be asking, are you guilty of sedition as you have been charged? And, and, and Jesus uh, needs to, he's jealous for the truth and he has to be confident in exactly what Pilate is asking. And so he says, are you, in the red there, are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? All he's saying is, are you asking me if I'm a king or if I'm guilty of what they've charged? Sedition. And Pilate responds in the next verse, and he says, look, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And uh, so now it's the table, and I've got to say again, it's a legitimate question. And Pilate has asked him, I mean, what's on the table? There's only one question. Are you a seditionist, right? Now, I've got to be quick, but this next verse, I love it. I think it may be one of the four or five most abused and misused verses in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. I'm not going to get into this. If it doesn't make any sense to you, don't worry about it. For those of you who understand, I like to say i got a lot of amillennialist friends, and if they accidentally drop their Bible, it plops open to this verse, right? I mean, this is their verse. My kingdom is not of this world. Now let's ask ourselves. Jesus, honest to goodness. Now we can reconstruct this in great detail. It's about 4.30 in the morning. Jesus is on trial before his life, uh, for, uh, uh, for his life. He's standing before a duly appointed judge who has asked him the, exactly the question that that judge ought to ask. Are you a seditionist? Time out. You say, wait a minute, he's interrogating the, 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 the accused. That's okay under Roman law. He's got it absolutely legitimate under Roman law. Under Jewish law, it's not. So the Sanhedrin is should, Caiaphas should have. This is perfectly legitimate. So, so, so Caiaphas, I'm sorry, Pilate asked him a perfectly legitimate, important question, and Jesus seizes the opportunity, I like to say, to give a one-sentence lecture on kingdom theology, which totally unsays everything the Hebrew Scriptures ever said. I don't think so. And if you wonder what he means, my kingdom is not of this world, it wouldn't hurt to read the next sentence. Because he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I be not taken. But my kingdom does not come in this way. Sedition. Now, here's a reality that you've got to take into account. After this conversation, there's part more, more to the conversation, but after this conversation, Pilate is going to go out, and folks, this is stunning. It is staggering. Pilate is going to go out, and for the first of five explicit times, he's going to announce this man is innocent. Against every impulse, I mean, it, was, it would have been the simplest thing. You can't overstate, you can't, it's so hard to appreciate the degree to which this is the most incendiary, explosive situation you can imagine. If this city wakes up and, 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 and they discover that their hero has been, there could be a riot, Pilate's head would roll, the Sanhedrin's head would roll. The simplest thing in the world is simply say, take him to the cross. But Pilate asks him an honest question, and Jesus makes an argument, and Pilate goes out, and again and again, he's going, it's stunning the degree to which he says, the man is not a seditionist. I am not going to crucify him. Now, here's my question. How came Pilate to that persuasion? There's only one answer, and that is the absolute airtight historical legal argument that Jesus makes. He simply says, are you a king? Are you a, king? Are you a seditionist? Pilate says, Jesus says, no, no. My kingdom is not of this, uh, of this world. It doesn't come, if my kingdom were of this world, just another worldly kingdom, then would my servants fight? Number one, 
every Roman official, every Roman soldier was trained to understand the way Jewish seditions worked, because they happen about every two decades, and they knew it well. And in every case, the seditionist is going to go find himself a, a hiding place, a, a fortress in the Jeshimon, down in the wilderness, and he's going to get a little army, he's going to come out, he's going to fall on the Roman troops, and the Roman armories, and, and, and so on. And, 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 so, and, and the other thing is, Pilate did not live in a cave. And this man, Jesus, has been going up and down the countryside. He's got hundreds of thousands of people totally committed to him. Not one of them has ever been any sort of threat to the Roman. And I think Pilate stood there and stroked his Roman chin and said, well, the man has a point. It, 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 he has had all of this ministry. I'm familiar with the ministry. And yet it would, you'd have to be insane to think this man is a seditionist after his three years of going up and down the countryside and doing good, and we've never had a hint. And from this point forward, you've got to deal with this. Pilate is absolutely committed to, to, to his conviction that Jesus is not a seditionist. And so now he, uh, and then, and then, and what's this got to do with anything? Pilate asks another question. He says, after Jesus has responded, he says, are you a king then? And uh, right here, and the, the point to be made here is that this has nothing to do with the interrogation. He is asking, are you, I mean, I think Pilate is clearly a seeker. He's alone with Jesus, and he asks, well then, are you a king? And I'm going to tell you something. This is one of my favorite verses. I'm a, I'm a fire-eating premillennialist because I am so hungry for the day when the knowledge of the glory of the Lord covers the earth like the water covers the sea. I know that in many quarters today we're told it's already here, not where I live. And I'm hungry for that day, all oh, for the day when every knee bows and every tongue confesses. And now Jesus is asked, are you a king? And Jesus says, you, you know what? Jesus was a premillennialist, I'll tell you that. <laughs> you say rightly that I'm a king. It was for this purpose that I was born. It was for this purpose that I came into the world to testify to that truth. It's a, it's a, it's a, a definite article. It's got demonstrative force to testify to this truth that I am a king. And then he says this, any man who is of the truth is going to hear my voice. All right, now I've got to do it in a hyperspeed because now Pilate comes out. Again, I want you to kind of get in a moment. So he's been in, in, in the praetorium there. He comes out. The, the, the Sanhedrin out here rubbing their hands. Okay, 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 let's get out with it. Sun's, you know, yeah, let's get out with it. And with some ceremony probably, Pilate goes up to his bema seat. There is a bema seat there. And Jesus stands here as the accused, shackled and so on. And, uh, and the Pharisees, uh, the Sanhedrin are waiting to hear. And Pilate says, I find no guilt in it. Oh, my goodness. What are you talking about? And, of course, they begin to say, no, no, you can't say that. He's been a troublemaker ever since Galilee. Pilate hears the word Galilee. He wants to be rid of this. You know, Acts 3, Peter says, you murdered Jesus when Pilate was determined to let him go. That's Peter in Acts 3. So my point is, Pilate, he doesn't want to do this, and so he doesn't want anything to do with it. He hears the word Galilee, and I'll just be quick. He says, well, wait a minute. I'm not in charge of Galilee. Herod Antipas is in charge of Galilee, and he's in town. As a matter of fact, I think he's staying. <laughs> there's some debate as to where Herod, actually, there's some, a lot of wild conjectures, and mine's one of them, but as to where Herod Antipas was staying, because he was in charge of Galilee, and his primary home was up there in Tiberias on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, but he too was in town for the feast. Where would he be staying? Well, this is, Herod the Great is his father. In other words, this palace is where Herod Antipas grew up. And I think he's probably staying in his quarters. I like to say he probably has the same posters on the wall. You know what I'm saying? And so, so he's just crossed the courtyard. They take Jesus to Herod, and, uh, and, and, and Jesus won't say anything, and nothing comes of it. And finally, Herod grows weary of it, and he sends back to Pilate. And this is actually the third stage of the Roman trial. Now, while they were waiting uh, while Pilate, and I, I picture him sort of sitting there in his bema seat and, and really not very confident at all that, that this is going to work. Herod Antipas is going gonna, is gonna to consent to handle this. But he's sitting there, and there's a wall here, but the bema seat is built so that he could look out on the, on the, the lawn, on the spreading hillside beyond the gate, 
because oftentimes it would be public declamations and that sort of thing from that, that point. So he's sitting there in his Bema seat, and he watches the city begin to wake up. Now, w with what kind of wildfire speed would the news that uh, this Nazarene, whom we welcomed as king on Sunday and cheered on Monday and Tuesday, that he was on trial for his life. And it's on the west side of the city. It's very open. So now the city begins to wake up, and, and, and people come in great numbers, and they're, they're interested in what's going on. And I, Pilate has an idea. It's a clever idea. It's a can't-miss idea. And he thinks, you know, every year at Passover, we release one criminal. Uh, just to let off some steam and all that's, that's building up. And, and, and we kind of had decided it would be Barabbas, but I can offer them Jesus. And certainly given Sunday and Monday and Tuesday, oh man, and that way I can just say to, to the fairies, sorry guys, you know, not my fault, they asked, and so I had to release them. And so in point of fact, Jesus is brought back, and he's probably standing, I like to think, maybe in this broad outer doorway, and, and maybe Pilate comes down and looks out at the crowd, and he says, I got something for you. Who would you have me give you, Jesus or Barabbas? Now, I made much of the point yesterday that on Tuesday night, Jesus had driven the city to a decision. It's me or the Pharisees. When Pilate offers them Jesus or Barabbas, the city announces its verdict. And I think Pilate must have been, well, I know he is. It, it, it's in the record. When they said, give us Barabbas, and the Bible says that the Sadducees persuaded them to say, but they begin to cry out, give us Barabbas. And Pilate says, what are you talking about? What would you have me do with Jesus, your king? By your own confession, you welcomed him as king just last Sunday. And they begin to cry out, crucify, crucify him. And so what happens is that uh, Pilate, Again, he announces that Jesus is absolutely innocent, but by reason, I haven't got get in, time to get into this. We'll talk a little bit about it in the morning, uh, hour, in the morning service. But what happens is that Jesus, uh, Pilate, I think, reluctantly, and by the way, this is Herod's palace yonder, that beautiful gate there. And, and, and in the gate, in the palace, he had built a special quarters for his Praetorian guard, the soldiers who guarded him. And so Jesus is, well, is taken in there, and, and taken to a place probably of, of uh, punishment, and he is scourged. And now they bring Jesus out, and it's right here. Uh, and, and the soldiers, and again, you've got you to gotta understand the attitude of the soldiers. For them, this man is a seditionist. He's been, uh, he's been uh, you know, he's been, that's been settled by, by the Sanhedrinists and so on. And so while they have him in there, they put a crown of thorns on his head, and the purple robe and now they're striking him with his hand so Jesus has been much abused and then as he's brought out verse 4 Pilate went out again and he said to them and I want you to picture because I think it's probably uh, right here in this outer gate and and Pilate stands here now there stands Jesus he's got the crown of thorns he's bloody uh, he's been beaten he's shackled he's got this cheap purple robe on and so on and Pilate says behold the man what is he saying? I think he's saying, have you had enough? Look at the man. You're claiming that that man is a threat to Rome? Just look at him. But the people continue to cry out, crucify him. And so once again, very quickly, uh, uh, well, what happens is that, look, Pilate says, behold the man, and, and they say, crucify him. And once again, this is the fourth of five times, Pilate said to them, you take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Folks, I'm going to say this later on, but uh, you have to understand, please understand, that you're going to hear people say, and I think usually it's careless, that Jesus died having been convicted of sedition. Oh, no. He died having been exonerated of sedition in the most dramatic way possible. The only man assigned to judge, the man who did, in fact, interrogate Jesus, the man who has full authority, five times says, the man is not a seditionist. I am not going to do it. It's so important to understand that in the record, of the way this folded out, the, and, and Pilate was such a central figure to it, that the record is clear that he was exonerated, he was vindicated, he was not a seditionist. Now, I'm going to qualify that just a little bit in the morning service. The point is this, that when they hear this, 
They, be, they say, John 19, 7, and there is unspeakable theological importance to this. They say, well, we have a law. If you won't crucify him as a seditionist, we have a law, and he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. Please understand, the reason Jesus went to the cross, we're going to talk about this in the morning service, is because he claimed to be God coming to flesh. All right, now, when Pilate hears that, he's the more worried. So he goes in a second time. With this, we're done. Give me two minutes. He goes back into that. He takes him in a second time. Look at verse 8. When Pilate heard that, he made himself the Son of God. He, he, he was the more worried, and he, he was the more afraid, and he went into the praetorium, and I love this. He said to Jesus, and I'm going to, uh, you're going to have to, well, this is a tough one, but he says, he says to Jesus, where are you from? Now, I think what he means is, what is going on here? They welcome you as king. They cheer you. Now, no matter what I do, I, I offer them, you have instead of Barabbas, I, 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 I got whipped. And, and, and I think the whipping was to maybe placate the bloodthirstiness of the crowd. But he, who in the world? And Jesus won't answer. And now Pilate says to him, uh, you're not going to answer me don't you know that I have power to crucify you and, uh, or to release you? Now, this is what I want you to think. And I know we're a little over time. Give me just a second. He says, Jesus answers and says, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Now, I know that you are reading that to mean you'd have no power unless my Father had given it to you. I don't think that's what he means exegetically it won't fit and furthermore it's kind of snarky you know kind of pat him on the head and say oh pilot don't take too much to yourself you wouldn't even be there if my father hadn't given it to you uh i don't think that's what jesus means by from above i think what he means is from authorities above you so what jesus is saying pilot and you know what i like to picture jesus maybe just stepping forward and taking those bloodied hands and 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 grabbing pilot looking right, right into his eyes and, and, and taking him by the shoulders and saying, Pilate, Pilate, you wouldn't have that authority except you were assigned this jurisdiction. Roman authorities above you gave you responsibility. Now, this is a well-reputed reading in the commentary and so on, but it's not the one we're used to. But I think that's exactly what it means because then you can make sense of the next sentence because he says, Pilate, you would have no authority whatever except it was assigned you. Therefore, the one who gave me over to you has the greater sin, and that's Caiaphas. So I don't think Jesus is saying, Pilate, don't take too much to yourself. I think he is saying, Pilate, this is not your fight. You wouldn't be here. You wouldn't have this authority except you were given this authority from those above you. Therefore, the one who turned me over to you, Caiaphas, as the greater sin. What is Jesus saying? And that's the hard thing. I think Jesus is saying, Pilate, go ahead. You've got to understand that this has to happen. Pilate has demonstrated a stunning reserve of character. He is desperate not to do it, and yet Jesus knows this has to happen. And I think he is carefully saying, Pilate, it's not your fight. The real guilt belongs to Caiaphas. Now, what's going to happen? Unless we're done, Pilate's going to come back out. Jesus, he's going to bring Jesus out, and he's going to try harder to release him. And now the accusers are going to say, they play their trump card. They say, if you don't release him, we're going to tell Tiberius, the Caesar. And Pilate had used up all of his coupons back there in Rome, and he knew that was a telling threat. But I think more importantly, there was, in the back of Pilate's mind, Jesus' words, this is not your fight. And now, Pilate is going to, I'm adding a little bit, I think this, Pilate's going to go back up to his seat. He's going to call for a basin and a rag. And with some ceremony, he's going to sit there and, and wash his hands. And I like to picture it this way, that maybe he comes down and makes his way into that gate, into the praetorium. As he does, maybe he takes that rag and hands it to the, one of the soldiers. And as he walks in, he looks back and he says, you do with him what you will. And in point of fact, he turns Jesus over to be crucified. And, and, and I'm not pretending that there's not cowardice and wickedness in that, and I think Pilate realized. 
But nonetheless, Jesus is turned over to be crucified. And so here's the thing. He's going to die the death that Rome designed for a seditionist. But he's going to die that death, having been in the most unmistakable, dramatic, deliberate way, exonerated, exculpated. He is not guilty of sedition. And so now Jesus is turned over to be crucified. And we'll pick that up in the morning service. All right, let me have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the time together for this marvelous, marvelous drama that you've spelled out. Help us to be careful with it. But Father, uh, might we, might we learn what it is to, to, uh, to, to press ourselves into this mold. Might we learn from this good confession that Jesus gave before Pontius Pilate. Go with us and we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Whatever you're going to do.